Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Oh, I'm Not Sick Yet edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 24th of January, 2018. Okay, I need to be up front here. Um, it's cold and flu season. I had a little cold last week, but uh, a lot of people around me, my wife and friends and uh, carpool people have been taken out by the flu, and it's a nasty one. I know you guys are having trouble at the... Uh, NHS over in England with the flu. Uh, it's it's a really bad year. It seems to be a very bad virus, and our hospitals are full of people who've developed complications because of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm avoiding having anything to do with anybody because I have a, a cataract operation scheduled uh -huh. for this Friday morning. Uh, so I may I may come back in my pirate mode <laughs> next week. Uh, so um, the, the two, two things are liable to interfere with these non-urgent operations. One is tragically road traffic accidents mm -hmm. where people come in off the roads and have to take priority. And the other is if you get flu. So I'm I'm um, I'm, I'm waving at people through my windows and <laughs> avoiding. It. Well, we do want people to pray for George. He's had the flu for about a week now, too. He's getting better with the flu, but he also has sepsis in his leg, and uh, he's getting some antibiotic oh. treatment. And You know, it's oh, just, I'm so sorry. yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, we, we do want to uh, keep George in our prayers, and uh, he's for not sure. been on the show now for uh, almost two weeks, and uh, that's killing him. I mean, this show's a lot of fun to do. <laughs> If you, as you know, if you're not sitting here laughing at your webcam, what are you going to do with your life? So, um, well, but, and, and and we miss him too. We do, we do I, 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 George always says things that I didn't <laughs> know, and I I, I wish I, yeah. I wish I'd said that <laughs> Oscar Wilde. Uh, so we need we need him back. <laughs> we do. Uh, for some reason, your camera has turned off. Not sure what the, it came back mm. on. It's on now. Okay. Ah, okay. technology. Oh, it's so good. All right. So now, you, obviously, this is your house in England. You're not. Yes, you're not in Normandy yes. this week. Okay, good. No, I'm. 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 I'm back. Back in England. Yes, that's right. right. There's been a lot of news the last ten days out of England. Um, there's this man from Canada. He's a philosopher. Uh, he's a teacher, uh, um, and his name is Jordan Peterson. And apparently, he's giving a tour because uh, he showed up uh, on on your shores and gave an interview with Kathy Newman. And uh, it's really made the, the viral rounds on the internet uh, as to two people who are saying things, but they're not hearing each other. Especially Kathy mm -hmm. was not hearing exactly what he was saying or even close to what he was saying and said, well, so you're saying this. And I'm watching that and I go, you know, this is what I'm seeing with uh, Archbishop Justin Welby. He's been told that uh, Bishop Bell is, is, there's just no evidence um, if Bishop Bell were taken to the court of law, they, they, he would be uh, found innocent. Uh, what's going on? And I, I thought, well, we could talk about a, a little bit of this. Um, Justin Welby put out a statement saying, listen, it's my integrity here, and I'm going to stick with what I'm saying because of the history we have found with uh, sexual predators in the church. <laughs> Got to talk to Gavin. Gavin, what's going on? So, Kevin, you're saying that we don't hear enough from archbishops in the media. Yeah, that's it. That's kind of <laughs> no, no, you're not saying that. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not saying that. We hear too much. Well, what we don't hear, especially with Archbishop Justin Welby, is um, reasons for this that are comprehensible. I mean, well, does, he have, does he have some evidence that we don't know about? That's, that's a good question. What I was trying to do was to replicate the ridiculous conversation that Kathy Newman had with Jordan Peterson. If I can go back to the beginning, um, although he is a philosopher, he's professionally a psychologist. And <laughs> I'm sorry, have I upset you? <laughs> oh, you did that so delicately. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's nice to see him cross himself, by the way, yes. Kevin. I like that. <laughs> across. Long day. <laughs> So Kevin Peters, a psychologist, I, I came across him when I was teaching psychology uh, as well, because he's a he teaches the psychology of religion. And he wrote a very interesting uh, book called Maps of Meaning about 15 years ago, which I was envious of mm -hmm. because I thought this is the I'd like to have written. Uh, and then he reemerged in public consciousness when he refused to be uh, to give in to the Ontario law over compelled speech for uh, for gender pronouns 
Um, one of the things he's done is to give voice to a public platform that really interests Christians. Uh, there's another question about how, how Christian Jordan Peterson is. Uh, he's certainly implementing a good deal of Christian theology, one of uh, his the underlying, uh, underlying ideas in his latest book is the produ production of order out of chaos. And, um, and as he has given lectures on the, on the Bible, he shows he's profoundly sympathetic to a Judeo-Christian interpretation of reality. The reason he matters to us is because however close to us as a practicing Christian he is or he isn't, he's identified our common enemy, which is, which is neo-Marxism mm -hmm. uh, and identity politics. And so, if you like, we have what he, what he is doing is saying, well, we have the danger of identity politics, which is immersing people in a collective identity, as over against this great gift um, of Christian existentialism, which is God makes individuals in His own image, and every single one of them is precious. So we have the collective against the individual. We have essentially Marxism, neo -Marx, new Marxism against the Jews. We could just call it fascism 2.0, but yeah, it's... Uh, well, of course, so now, so, so now, as Jordan Peterson always rightly says, it depends on what you, how you define fascism. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, both fascism and neo-Marxism contain at their heart a, a determination to force individuals not only to speak, but to think in an acceptable way. So um, one of the exciting moments on his tour came when he was presented with uh, an uber feminist called Kathy Newman. She's uh, a, a clever and uh, a gifted and, and an attractive woman and she's pretty assertive. Uh, and they had half an hour to talk okay. together. Very assertive. <laughs> she's very assertive. pretty assertive. And, she's and, kind and, of assertive. No, she was very assertive. <laughs> I was uncomfortable with just her introduction. You know, I'm like, I feel small. <laughs> well, as Jordan Peterson has said, and reflecting on the interview afterwards, this was a power struggle. Mm -hmm. It was a power struggle between two individuals, between a man and a woman, uh, between two world views, uh, and, and and the most interesting thing, apart from the fact. But Peterson produced evidence to show Kathy Newman that she was mistaken. Mm -hmm. The most interesting thing was the fact that she didn't hear what he said. She she came to the whole thing so ideologically closed that that as he spoke to her, she simply um, she simply responded as if he had said what she expected him to say instead of what he said. Well, there were a lot of people who were absolutely thrilled at the way this panned out because there the, the came a, a wonderful moment when she attacked him for uh, for being offensive towards transgender people and causing some distress. And he said, well, it's no different from the way you have been offensive to me uh, and caused me distress. <laughs> but you're right to do it because you're trying to get hold of the truth. As a good journalist, you're entitled to do that. As a good psychologist, I'm entitled to do that too. So don't you criticize me for causing offense when this whole exercise of yours has caused me has been at my expense and caused me offense. And that seems to cause you no trouble at all. So let's have a single standard, not double standards. And this is a wonderful moment when she just crashed and she 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 didn't know what to say. <laughs> well, she did so the eye close. She did the eye roll. And I've seen that from my <laughs> wife many times. And then <laughs> and that's when you are doing a debate or a, a conversation with somebody and you, now she still didn't get his point. She was still, you know, beckoned on her uh, ideology. Well, uh, well I, I, I want to make one more point here uh, quickly. Have you ever seen the documentary "The Red Pill"? No. Uh, it's a made by a former feminist, and the whole documentary is about what I used to hear people say when I was a feminist. What I hear them say now, at post-feminist, and I. I'm just looking at how Kathy was reacting. She was hearing all these key words in the way she was taught, you know, as a feminist. Yes, um, I think that's true. I suspect that there are different Kathy Newmans yeah. um, in the sense that, you know, we have different ways of receiving things so, so, sometimes and different parts of our personality. So it was very interesting to see whether or not the real Kathy Newman came out from behind her mask, uh, Jordan Peterson is 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 something of a Jungian. And he uses a lot of Jungian language. So in this particular case, 
he describes her as being animus possessed. Interesting he should use that language. In other words, a, a, a certain male way of doing things uh, had, um, had, had taken her over. This is part of her aggression. And she was unable to separate the real Cathy Newman from this presentational, um, aggressive uh, interrogator that she had become. So there's just a possibility that in there somewhere, there's a real Cathy Newman who, who could listen with her soul, uh, but who may be vetoing it because the feminist, the will to power uh, person can't afford to lose everything they've invested in their personality. Um, but what we're left with is the, the difficulty of ideologically motivated human beings communicating with each other. And, and we know this too amongst Christians. Christians can, uh, at their worst, become ideologically driven and unable to hear what other people say, uh, which which means we then can't evangelize, we can't listen, we can't love, because uh, a relationship involves two people being part of the conversation, even if that's scary sometimes. So one, as you quite rightly said, there seems to be an obvious link between uh, Kathy Newman, the ideological neo-Marxist uber-feminist, inability to hear truth as it was evidentially presented to her, and the inability of the Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> to hear truth as it's evidentially presented to him over this safeguarding case which involves the dead George Bell. Well, there's been a, over the last week or no, it's two weeks, a letter writing campaign for many uh, professors and uh, historians within the uh, Church of England, outside the Church of England, said, you got to get this straight. You know, you, you got to come forward, uh, Archbishop, apologize, set the record state, because if you don't do it, the next Archbishop's going to do it. And it's going to make you look really uh, small and pitiful. He won't do it. Now, you and I have uh, said, well, if he's not going to do it, he needs to resign. Um, this is the, the march down to the end of uh, his Archbishopsness. And uh, um, I don't see a way forward if he doesn't uh, say he's sorry and uh, correct what he said. I love I love the phrase archbishopness. It's often called archiepiscopate by no, other no, people, no. but archbishopness. It's archbishopness a Kevin is, term. <laughs> it's, it's great. Let's stick with it. Let's stick with the Kevin term. Um, it's very difficult to know what will come out of this. I think, uh, I mean, so first of all, you're quite right. Uh, he runs the risk of uh, future archbishops doing to him what he has done to both to George Carey, and and to George Bell, uh, and that is saying your your judgment is so flawed that you are effectively um, excommunicate, you're a bad person, you're, you're out of here. Uh, that, so that's the very first thing he's done. Um, the second thing is that it, it, it seriously undermines his capacity to stand up for integrity, for truth, for honesty and for justice. Because if in this one particular case where all the demands of integrity, truth, honesty and justice are, are going one way and he's going the other, well, it calls into question his judgment uh, and his commitment to the real thing instead of the presentational thing. So this will certainly have the effect of undermining his integrity and his leadership. Um, of course, he won't resign because uh, there must be an element of, of power in this. Uh, there are a number of theories as to why he won't take on board this evidence. He says it's his commitment to safeguarding. But actually, there comes a point when uh, that's irrational. I mean, for example, he said, um, I, I refuse to resign. So, so let's do this chronologically. Okay, You're quite, go for there it. Were, uh, il, il, I think uh, there were 11 uh, church historians, seven professors of, of ecumenical or ecumenical leaders, a group of choristers who knew George Bell as children and were themselves, uh, uh, they experienced predatory pedophiles and they all wrote in saying the historian saying you you can't deal with truth like this you, you know this is a very serious professional error as historians we cannot allow you to imagine that you are serving anything good by this poor judgment the ecumenical people wrote in saying uh, you you just haven't grasped the stature of george bell uh, and the evidence you're bringing against him compared to the evidence for him is mismatch. The choir boys wrote in saying, we knew him and, and we can smell a piece of fire. <laughs> and, and he wasn't one. Um, so, uh, so Justin Welby was then, then responded by making a statement and said, uh, my integrity requires me not to change my mind. And by the way, have you not realized that the church has uh, been careless 
about predators in the past. Let me introduce you to Peter Ball and look what a mess that was. We're not making that mistake again. To which the answer is is devastatingly simple. Uh, Peter Ball's accusers are alive. Mm -hmm. uh, they went to the police. The police arrested him. They brought the evidence out. It went into court. Peter Ball was convicted and now he's in jail. Uh, it was all a matter of evidence and testing the evidence. And none of this applies to George Bell. So how on earth is it possible, uh, apart from by the looseness of associations, two men have been involved in complaints about sexual misbehavior? How on earth is it possible to compare one to the other? Like All right, well, I have two theories. One kind of humorous, one very sad. The first one would be that he just doesn't want people to get Bell and Ball confused. So just throw them both overboard. Okay, we'll just throw them both to the, the trash bin of, of history. Sadly, I think the other uh, possibility is maybe as a young uh, person, he was molested uh, inside or outside the church. And this is just him fighting back. Of course he's guilty. You know, and so that's... Kevin's theory 101, it may not be correct, but when you look at this type of situation, you have to say, what's going on here? Why won't Justin mm -hmm. look at the evidence and at least confirm the evidence? He won't even confirm the evidence that's that's available. So, well, I, I have, I think both those are, are possible, um, and I, and I apologise in a way for yeah. uh, acting as like an armchair psychologist. We're not qualified to do it, but but on the other hand, uh, you know, you you need to find some explanation mm -hmm. in order to 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 deal with the phenomena. I think the one that appeals most to me is is, is this issue of power. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when when he first appeared in the General Synod, uh, and he stood up and made his first speech, and I listened to. And effectively, he said, uh, if you're not on board with women as priests and, and bishops, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And I sat there thinking, oh, wait a moment. I thought we were committed to mutual flourishing. I thought we were committed to a twin track mutuality. Well, that depends what? on how you define <laughs> flourishing. You were silly to define it the way you did. Uh, I was silly. Uh, and I, w I was taken aback at uh, uh, what I thought was the bullying tone. Mm -hmm. uh, then one's heard stories, and this one can't rely on this at all, but they keep on coming, about fairly substantial people who say, I've never been spoken to in such a humiliating fashion by anybody before, as I have been by Justin Welby. So there seems to be an element uh, in there of um, uh, of somebody who's, who's capable of throwing his weight around, and perhaps you would call it bullying if people allow themselves to be bullied, you know, you have to have someone who's willing to do it. I I think that that um, he he may very well have become too much the, the CEO in charge of an organisation. It's very must be immensely frustrating to be an archbishop of this appallingly organic uh, institution where there are so few levers of power. One of the things he's done is to create a whole series of levers of power from the archbishop's council down through a whole series of funding mechanisms where he holds the purse strings. And you can see what he's trying to do is to control an organisation he's in charge of to make it work better. Well, that's that's honourable and I think that's sensible. But I think what's happened is the, the kind of internal chaos, we're almost back to Jordan Peterson again, the, the chaos of the organism of the Church of England has produced an overreaction in a man who was trained in, in, in big oil business. And I suspect he's reaching out to exercise power in a way that is just inappropriate and beyond the bounds of what can be done and, and is now panicking because uh, this whole business of safeguarding is something that could blow the public reputation of the church up into the air and into smithereens. I'm sure he feels under his watch. Well, what could be and beyond so, chaos? I mean. well, <laughs> so I, I think, I, I suspect that he simply decided on a zero tolerance policy and he stopped thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's mixed zero tolerance policy with his own reputation as CEO, with the difficulties of uh, the church's reputation in the public sphere and the problems of trying to run something that is a church and not an organization and can't be run and he's he's kind of closed down but the problem is it does require more from him than the response that he's now given and i think that response shows that um his 
uh, either archiepiscopate or his archbishopness may, <laughs> may may be more more limited and will certainly be held in less value than it could have been otherwise. Well, I saw this week a fumble uh, as far as uh, the uh, desires of the Archbishop of York and the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, from what I can tell, you guys had a suggestion in the House of Bishops uh, a little while ago that we need to open up the church to transgendered people and, and oh, really offer yes. them uh, our, their own set of liturgical prayers. And um, we can do that because of the Church of England. We're as progressive as we want to be, and uh, we're going to set the tone for the world. We're going to be the model church for the world to see and all of a sudden I'm, i was watching the live feed and uh this thing got voted down no transgender prayers won't be taken up well yet maybe in a year or two and I'm like wait a minute now did everybody get wise did the was this a second coming event what's going on with the house of bishops and I'm, I bet it was just a procedural oops. What do you know in the background? No, 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 no. It, it wasn't a procedural oops at all. It's part of this sophisticated and, frankly, uh, reprehensible strategy that, that, that the archbishops together and the House of Bishops are taking, which is this. Uh, it is to, to keep the critics quiet by saying that we will do nothing formal at a formal level, but at the same time, uh, pleasing the whole secular culture by saying to the clergy, hey, you know what? You can do what you like. Uh, because the Bishop of Norwich immediately, so, so you're right, the House of Bishops have voted down what Synod had presented them with. But all they were doing was saying, we are not going to make a formal change to the Church of England. What we'll instead do is we will we will uh, allow the clergy to do what they like on pastoral grounds. Mm -hmm. This is exactly, this is just another version of the gay marriage debate. That's right, the Church of England will not change its canons on gay marriage. What it will do instead is provide a whole series of liturgies for people to uh, practice pastoral support at the local level, which of course become indistinguishable from gay marriage because, as we've said so often, as Michael Nazi Ali has so often said too, the Church believes what it, as it prays. And in this particular case, though there won't be there won't be a new liturgy for transgendered people to have a baptism. But you know what, said said Bishop James, we already have the a liturgy for celebrating, uh, for, for re-celebrating baptism. You can use that and you can do it as a transgendered person. In other words, um, there is no effective difference on the ground. We will have transgendered liturgies for baptism to celebrate this new identity constructed out of the wounded confusion of the person's mind that runs counter to their biology. So it's it's do one thing in public and another in private, which is essentially hypocrisy. Uh, no, and, no it's, and it's, it is exactly hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, right. Well, the the wisest person... You, you stop me foaming at the mouth. Thank you so yeah, much. No, it's like, <laughs> no, I, it just drives me crazy. One of the wisest people I ever met was uh, Father Ellen Benedict. And I was having to discuss him once with him because, Kevin, you don't get it, do you? And I'm a young 30-ish uh, Christian at, at the time and what don't I get what do you say Kevin it's not what you believe it's not what you read it's what you do mm. okay you, you, you know you do what you believe mm. that's silly no 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 that doesn't make any sense because you know it, I, I, I believe it in my heart no if you're doing it wrong you're not believing it in your heart oh man what a conviction and you know that that set me off uh, on a, a different course in, in my walk uh, to be sure I was doing it right, not just believing it right. Uh, and that really helped with my prayer life too. But they're doing it wrong in the Church mm. of England. Yes, and they're going to continue to do it wrong. Oh. Yes, yes, they, they are. And, and um, well, it's a disaster. Mm. I mean, spiritually spiritually uh, intellectually theologically uh it's a disaster there must come a point when you if if the practice of a society uh in so at so many levels flies in the face of scripture and tradition uh, and the discernment of of, of the of the most uh, eminent and respectable christians one can think of you must say at some point this is not the way to do christianity we're doing something else uh, but I'm afraid that the, the people on the whole want comfort and convenience and approbation, mm -hmm. uh, and so they'll they'll go along with it. But um, but it will stop being the church in any recognizable way. 
It will. I just saw a Harvard study, it was conducted about a year ago, that showed that the Church of Affirmation is shrinking, dying yeah. really, but the, the Church of Transformation is uh, uh, taking off, not hugely, but it's doing a lot better than the Church of Affirmation uh, in the society. And it says the church is strong. Uh, I'll provide a link to that study in the in the show notes. I'm also going to provide. That's wrong. Yeah, I'm going to provide. But, 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 a, what? Go ahead. Well, you interrupted me. What? 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 <laughs> people don't know. There's about a four a four second uh, a break between or buffer between uh, when I speak and when he finishes hearing me speak. It's not that he wasn't paying attention. It's you know Gavin is finally hearing the end of my conversation and he's got a good point to make and uh, uh, Gavin often does. You're very kind. No, no. Pe people, people want to be rescued more than they want some kind of spiritual icing. And of course, they, they, they want spiritual icing to begin with. But actually, only until life gets sufficiently serious, and then they need rescue and transformation. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure you're right. I've seen the same study. Uh, and, and I agree. Um, the, the, the mainline denominations that are pursuing a secular path are losing people hands over fifth, fist. Uh, and as you say, transformational Christianity that demands something from people is attracting larger and larger numbers. So, yes, it'd be very good to have the link up. Mm -hmm. Gavin, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, but I mean, let the people know out there, uh, where we, are, we need donations. Not because we're broke. Yes. We're going to be broke. <laughs> we're going to GAFCON. And uh, so sometime before uh, June, I need to raise at least, I'd say, $6,000 for your plane ticket, George's plane ticket, my plane ticket. For finding a location to stay, I found a nice Airbnb and B that has Wi-Fi uh, that's near the convention center. Um, Gafcon, it's you know obviously it's the heir apparent um, to the Anglican Communion. Uh, all the other uh, facilities within the Anglican Communion, Archbishop of Canterbury, the ACC, uh, the Primates meeting, Lambeth are failing, and Gafcon seems to be the way forward. We're going to be there to cover it, doing interviews, being the winsome people we are, but we need your help. So if you could go to the website anglican.inc forward slash donate, click on the PayPal button, or if there's an address there where you can send a check, uh, it would really help us uh, get to GAFCON 3. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to episode 363.